Safari Rally. And remember that KBC will be broadcasting the opening ceremony, the ceremonial podium at the end of the rally, five live TV stages and lots of conversations that <coughs> we shall be having. So, 10 days, as you can see there. So we are going to be having a conversation about rally in just a short while. And also we'll be talking the beach games so that are going to be taking place over Easter. So down in, up in the Rift Valley, we're going to be having the rally. And in Malindi, the beach games. And also this weekend, we saw a spectacle last year out in Western Kenya where the school games attracted huge numbers of fans, something that would make a lot of local sport envious. And so we're going to be speaking to secretaries from three regions in sport to talk about this weekend's regional school games as they build up to the nationals. Also, from our news team, the Health Cabinet Secretary, Susan Commission, is meeting the doctors' unions, and the Judicial Service Commission is carrying out interviews for the, com uh, the Chief Registrar of the Judiciary. And also, there is a launch of the Land Strategic Plan by Land Cabinet Secretary, Alice Wahome. So, we shall be having that conversation. Our sign language interpreter is... Uh, is Lucy Moaora with Invisa. She's going to be joining us, bottom right of your screen. Well, we'll start a conversation with the WRC Safari Rally in studio with me. I've got two people. The chief marshal on my immediate left is Kariba Moko. Oh, Karibu. And we also have got a safety officer, Abbas Murbe. Welcome. Thank you. And also joining us on Zoom, before we get to have a conversation with the two gentlemen, is the chief medical officer. He's not only a, a medic, a, you know, one of the best surgeons we've got in the country, but he's also a motorsport competitor. Joining us on Zoom from Nairobi is Professor Raj Jutli, the chief medical officer of the WRC Safari Rally. A good morning to you, Professor. Good morning, Daniel. How are you? I am very, very well. It's a pleasure that you've given us um, some few minutes today as you build up towards this. And let's start, first of all, with the you know, clear definition of the role that you play. And I'll also be coming up, and you can also add to the one extra person who was added to your docket, the Chief Rescue Officer. Has a very, very uh, senior role within the Valley Control. So he is overall in charge for the organization training, training, identification, and deployment of all the resources during the rally, in addition to the anti-doping, which, as you know, in the last few years, has been kept, become increasingly important. Last year, because of the uh, hybrid drive train, they introduced the role of a chief rescue officer. He will be now one of my frontline staff with my doctors, arriving at the scene, making sure safe before we then we can intervene unless of course there's a life threatening emergency. So straight to, uh, to it and because you've got the advantage not only of being a competitor but also as a medic this is something you've done a lot in sport in fact even working with the world rally championship teams what are the key checks that you always have around competitors especially the p1 and p2 drivers before every rally that they've got to confirm. So, you're absolutely right, Daniel. Not only does your role extend to uh, you know, making sure the event is safe, but in some of the unique events, such as a safari, you've got to be able to brief them on the challenges they don't see somewhere else. Hydration, heat, stress, animals, how to behave if they have an incident out in the middle of the stages. And, as you probably know, I have a personal interest in hydration as well. So I also look up after the hydration of some of the P1 drivers, including Toyota Team and our Anthony for the Hyundai drivers, as well as some of the locals who would be of interest. So that the other aspect of it, and this is where it comes now critical, you mentioned the anti-doping regulations. Um, I think the first one that comes in motorsports, there a prohibited substance is alcohol. That's the first one. But what are the key things you look, um, that you look out for in terms of anti-doping? Because there is so much focus on it on athletics, but in motorsport it is different. Yes, and you would argue that you can do more damage if you were doped behind the wheel of the car than if you were running around the track. So in the last few years, the anti-doping has taken anti-doping very seriously. In the last um, few years, we've also bought 
equipment that randomly checks people for alcohol, and we have caught up people, including officials in the past, just to be able to, you know, put them up as key cases, key index cases that look like we're going to take this seriously. And the way it works is that we get notification of an anti-doping test well in advance. The chairman of the stewards, the chief medical officer, gets notification. And then at the end of the rally, we have four anti-doping officers who are trained, specifically trained and signed off by the medical delegate and the chairman of the stewards, who then would accompany those people off the podium within line of sight and get them tested at the end of the event. So we've had quite a few in the last few years, we've done about five, which is probably well over 50% of all the notice group antidote tests done on the continent. So it's something that we're trying to message out to everyone. Come on folks, those days of having a tester in driving <laughs> Now the other one is, and this is very crucial, um, this is where everyone will see you from a doctor's perspective medical intervention. Just take us through that process because I know Abbas and uh, Kariba will also be coming in here and talking about the safety part of it. So Daniel, I can tell you categorically that we've sold in the last few years A and A plus in medical intervention within the entire World Championship and that's how I plan to keep it. This is my sixth year in running as a Chief Medical Officer and the team we have on the ground is nothing short of spectacular. And I mean, my first-tier medics are absolutely phenomenal. We have surgeons and anesthetists who are going to be arriving at the scene first, and all of these people have been with the event since inception. So, again, I'm going to take this opportunity to mention some names. We have B.P. Chohan, we have Andrew Morisi and uh, Martin Mathenge leading the clinical team. These guys... It's only because of these guys that we are where we are today. So I'll be using as my front line two helmets. These are helicopters, probably vehicles, which have been configured specifically for the event, with access to a third helicopter, which I can come commandeer in the event of a crisis. I have 25 MIBs, all of ALS standards which means that each one has a ventilator, cardiac monitoring, defibrillator, drugs, and have, in addition to that, five MIDs which are des designated as critical care intensive ambulances in which I can ventilate somebody and transport them to Nairobi to a specialist center within 25 minutes. The other one is that to the public, mm -hmm. and this is especially when they are doing things, what you can think in transport, or some, especially in transport. What's a message you give to the public if they really would like to help? Because they, they want to help, but they will do it the wrong way. Indeed, and we've sometimes had these unfortunate incidents where the public can cause no harm. But the message is very, very simple. If you see a P1 car, and a P1 car, these ones are the hybrid drive train, and they have three when soon enough, which is the normal car, you can approach it. If you see a red light or an audible alarm, or you do not see a light, then please do not touch the car, stay away with it. And there's a marshal who will be there who will instruct you what to do, what not to do. Please, under no circumstances, are you to touch any car. If the car is overturned, give the competitor's time to self-extricate. The highest chances of survival for any competitor is the one that comes out by the car himself or herself. Do not wipe the car. I have an MIV that will arrive there in less than 10 minutes. My av average distance between my medical intervention vehicles is four kilometers throughout the entire event, and I have two helicopters in circulation. And trust me, I will see the dynamics of that car 10 times a second using the GPS technology so I know where the G-forces are in the X, Y, and Z direction and the mechanism of injury. And on the P1 drivers, I have cameras. So we will direct from rally control what to do, but I'd rather like to direct my doctors and not the members of the staff and up to members of the public. So please do not approach, do not touch, wait for a marshal, wait for the doctors, wait for the paramedics, 
And please refrain from going too nuts on social media. Um, uh, let me bring you back to hydration because you've done a lot of work um, on sports hydration. Elite athletes really benefit from you. There are those who are in sport, motorsport, especially those in motorsport. How do they effectively manage their hydration? And in the process of sweating, times you lose essential so, uh, minerals and salts. How do they manage that? So, Daniel, about 11 years ago, I invented a hydration drink. It was patented internationally, and right now it's selling all over the world. And it was initially developed for motorsports, so my first time for a Red Bull Formula One, as well as a handful of WRC drivers. Over the years, this drink has become extremely successful in triathlon, and in fact, you may recall Elish McCorgan beating the Kenyans two years ago in Commonwealth Games. Well, Elish was my ambassador, so we worked with her just to prove that we could maximize human performance using science and medicine. Now, in the recent years, in Belgium two years ago, the Toyota World Rally team asked me to test their drivers and to get them a concoction of electrolytes, hydration components, hydration products, as well as energy products to be able to maximize performance. And that was after Cali had tried one of my gels. And today, I look after that team and I look also after a couple of them died drive. We've seen a little bit of the uptake in Kenya. I don't know why, but globally it's doing extremely well. So it's, you're given a drink that's matched your physiology, and we do that by doing a very sophisticated sweat test. And the drink that's then made for you is customized according to your sweat analysis in addition to your environmental conditions and the amount of volume and the saltiness of sweat. Thank you very much, Professor Raj Jetley. He's the Chief Medical Officer, WRC Safari Rally. And also, he has competed in the Safari Rally, by the way, when it was still uh, the WRC event years back, 99, I think 98, 99, 2000, around that time. He's competed, and would like to say thank you very much for giving us this time today. And hope to see you down in Naivasha, and all the best to you. Santa Santa, Professor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Professor Wright Gidley, the Chief Medical Officer, WRC Safari Valley. And also, we'll be expecting to join the Chief Safety Officer, Norris Ongalo, who's going to be joining us on Zoom also, because they're having a Heads of Department meeting, so it's easier for us to use technology and catch up with them. Now, back to studio, and just to reintroduce my guest, Kariba Moko, who is the Chief Marshal of the WRC Safari Valley, mm -hmm. and also we've got a Safety Officer, Abbas Murbe. So, yep, let me start with you, um, Hariba, as the Chief Marshal, uh, you have real, real big tasks to run, yeah. and just give us a background of your role. Okay, well, so the Chief Marshal is responsible for about 700 marshals, uh, 500 uh, main marshals and 200 local marshals. Uh, ideally, we try to also benefit... the staff, the size of KBC. Correct. So, <laughs> over, over, over a weekend. So, we've got 10 days to... Uh, good thing is now with uh, Abbas's help, we've uh, uh, taken most of the training online. So, we have a good training module that then takes them through the expectations of the rally. I think you've had uh, Prof. Jackley talk about what to expect on our car rolls. Uh, I think you saw last year when f the Ford rolled. Uh, last year, about one. Uh, no, it's last year. So when you rolled uh, in Suesambu, uh, you saw the response by the marshals there trying to cordon off the area. One of the things that we've then used from that uh, scenario to train marshals is on what lights to look out for and when then public can be allowed to at least assist. Uh, normally green is a safe color, any other color, including no color is a no-go zone. So uh, that's my role in a nutshell. Well, and when he talks about green color, well, I've got this here. It's the work safety instructions for marshals. And this is something, you know, uh, that everyone must have in the equipment that they all must know about a car. So I have it here with me. So it's all there and we're going to be coming into it. Um, Abbas, let's come to you and, you know, just give us the details and to clarify it, mm -hmm. that thin line between safety mm -hmm. and security. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I know the safety department in the WRC is simply about 
compliance with the FIA. We take our guidance from laser safety guide that and then translate it into what we have on the ground. Once the route is identified, we look at the risks and then the threats, try to mitigate and prevent it. From there, we can come up with a number which will be suitable for all the scenarios that we have put in place. That's when we go back to the chief marshals. Tell you, okay, fine. For this event, we need 400 marshals. Then we look at what are their needs. Then we start looking at those needs of training them, pre-events, and then we also look at their background, past events in rally. Like one of the things that I can say we have tried is that we always encourage marshals to be part of the national clubs before coming to WRC. So that whatever they learn from us, they can go to the grassroots. Now, when it comes to safety, safety does not involve in the rallying section part of the rally. It is strictly on the dangers and the hazard. Rallying is extremely dangerous. Those cars can travel at a speed of almost average 150, 150 kilometers an hour. So when you tell a marshal, take care of the spectators, he knows the risks. And that's a training that we train them. Now, when it comes to security, we are not the police. Our security is more to do with ensuring, ensuring that everything runs the way we say it runs. Mm. Because what happens during the rally, safety is actually monitored by FIA. Mm. When those cars go around, when you say you're going to have a marshal in a box number five, that marshal must be there. If he's not there, it's a penalty. It's a penalty for us. Response time, like what Jude says, we support the medical team in terms of what they should they do. Before the medical team comes, there are preparations that we need to put into place before the medical team comes in so that it makes their work easier to intervene. And all involves planning. Yeah. And then when it comes to that, that's when it comes from organization from our side. Well, we're coming through and in the poll, you, uh, for you to identify these people, they always have gear with them and they will have tabards. Mm -hmm. And we have got the two tabards here. So, Ariba, just to... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's... Mm -hmm. can see that. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you, you, your typical marshal will have uh, an orange uh, turban. So that's, that's um, normally what happens is sometimes members of the public will most likely go to the NYS team. But we normally encourage, look for a civilian dressed uh, in an orange turban. It will also clearly mark uh, the role, uh, just in case uh, the color did not uh, give you a hint as to who the individual is. Now, the reason why you want to do that is because the individual is trained on where to place you based on the location he's at. Sometimes we have drivers who come in pretty early and want to be in the stages. So we do allow for that, but you have to come in pretty early, 4 a.m., 3 a.m., that we can allow you to go in, especially for the first slip. Um, so then we have the next level after the marshal is a post-chief marshal. He has a blue top. Uh, but for those who are in, who may be at the... Hybrid uh, in, in the hybrid, hybrid quarantine area, you will then see them with a purple uh, turban. Then we also have... Oh, uh, oh that now. <laughs> <laughs> I may understand this. Okay. A hybrid quarantine area. Correct. Just uh, d define that. So so the WRC, the P1 cars have a hybrid... Actually, we can lift the okay. turban so that they, they can know, so that if they see me at a Takamoto cut suit, at yes. they understand. <laughs> Yes. So in case in case of a crash, you will most likely see a marshal with this color. Uh, it just it just basically means that he has come to ascertain that there has been no thermal runway, uh, which may happen in, in in the case of a crash, or to make sure that the car is basically safe to approach. Um, uh, but normally, if you don't see this marshal, there's also another indicator on the car. If, it, if the light is green, then that means the car is safe to approach. Now, if you don't see a green light, please stay away from that car because you could get electrocuted and you could die. Mm. And for us, loss of life is failure. Uh, mm -hmm. I hope that, hope that clarifies it. That clarifies and, it. Yes. Yeah. and to add on that, uh, mm -hmm. it's very important for us to know the drivers are well trained. They will only take instructions from people wearing this. Correct. Nothing else. Yeah. You can go there with a suit. Give us <laughs> a <laughs> you never listen to you. Only a madman will go to you. Yes. <laughs> if he sees this, he knows he's official. Yeah. Now what happens is that the drivers are also trained. 
should they have a problem with their car, the hybrid, they know where to park. We have, we have dedicated quarantine areas within the rally route. Yeah. Uh -huh. He has to park it there. Mm -hmm. The moment and it is in their note, in their note, okay. in their safety book, mm -hmm. they are told. The moment he gets there, because the work driver gets out, leaves the car, it will be the quarantine's responsibility now. Yeah. To make sure that car mm -hmm. is safe, nobody touches it until the recovery team comes in. Now, so the other one I want to talk about is this. I want to think of two scenarios. I mean, two, I mean, actually two scenes. Mm -hmm. One is KICC. Mm -hmm. Then after that, uh, Kasarani Super Special. Mm -hmm. Just give us a normal day at KICC, Abbas. Okay. But given the timings that are there, when you allow people in and when you not allow them in. Okay. In real sense, in places like Kasarani, you can move in anywhere. Mm. The only restriction that we have is on the rally route, which is closed mm. one hour before the rally starts. Yeah. What does that mean? People tend to be excited, want to be on the rally route. We always tell them, do not. Why do we do that? Because we have what we call a safety convoy that starts two hours before the rally starts. Mm. What it does, it goes to verify what the chief marshal has done. Mm. He'll be the first one to go around his shop to see are all my marshals there. Mm -hmm. Once he finishes, he radios back, then there's a spec, which mm -hmm. goes on to see the spectators are there, are they seated in order, there's a triple zero, checks on the route, double zero, then zero. Once the zero car comes in, no one is allowed to come in. Mm -hmm. Now, for example, like in KST, it is more of a ceremonious. Yes. So there will be not much for us there. Mm -hmm. We just go there, see, but uh, this the convoy will have to go through Kasarani, do a loop to make sure everything is in place, report back to the rally headquarters. Once it is ready, and it has to be timely mm -hmm. with the ceremony in KCC, so that by the time they are coming, everything is set. Yes. And they run. Now, the moment the run starts, that's when the unraveling starts. Should anything happen, now the safety team and the medical team, now they are... Mm -hmm. yeah. How they have to work. Prepared, yeah. yeah. For anything eventuality, yeah. Um, when, uh, as a, yes, you want to do it? Yeah, I was, mm -hmm. was going to say, one of the things that uh, we've noticed is that everyone, everyone rallies to go to Kasarani, but, I, but, I, but there's a small Easter egg called Shekta that happens on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. It's not part of the competitive race, it's actually when the rally crew are testing out their cars. Now, one of the things I've always told rally fans, uh, because at the end of the day, why are we doing safety? Because we want more fans on the stages to see the, to see the drivers that they love. And we normally say they get to do so many loops that they probably wouldn't do in a competitive stage, and, and, and it's a much easier feel. And we normally encourage a lot of the people, if possible, drive down to Lowell Deer. Uh, happens on Wednesday for the shakedown stage. You get to see the cars Katsuta rolled there last year, so that, that was pretty fun. I know somebody, I know souvenir collectors. Three boot doors yes, yes, were collected yes. last year. So, 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 and, and they, really, they really hammer those cars out because they need to configure the cars uh, for the rally. Uh, so that's that's something that we normally encourage mm -hmm. uh, people to come for. Uh, it's not a competitive stage, uh, so then it doesn't really count. But it's it's what it's what watching, and it's mm -hmm. where they are doing ranking, eh? Mm -hmm. Correct. Mandatory for the P1, they have to do three loops, mm -hmm. and the fastest is only going to start the rally. Yeah, that's what they do. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so it's it's it's, it's, it's really interesting because that's when you actually you understand the drivers. They're not just drivers; mm -hmm. they're mechanics. Correct. They know their vehicles. Oh yes. Oh, if you can. I mean, I've. Um, think it, yeah, you know, and, and they can also be very creative yes. because I remember Terry Melville once upon a time ran out of radiator fluid and yes. decided to take a, be a cold beer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and and, 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 and yeah. get his yeah. car stoned. Yeah. yeah. But it was an interesting. As the chief marshal. Yes. Um, you have to get him through the stage Correct. before the others who have been assigned by the stewards to yes. the car zero zero. Yes. Just take us through what what happens. So so my call sign is pilot one. So I I am in one hour before the rally starts. I have the safety book before me that specifies a couple of things. One the stage markings mm. uh, so it so it tells me where to expect all my marshals. It also has the route map which I then follow and mm. check if everything has been set up by the stage commander as had been agreed mm -hmm. in the safety book. Now, in the case in the case that I 
uh, as I'm running through uh, at, well, not, not really as fast as the rally cars, but as I'm running through, if I notice anything, I have a duty then to radio that uh, to rally control, but I also have a duty, uh, for example, escape routes that are not marked ETC, just get out of the car, mark it, and then uh, note the change in the safety plan, so that the convoy is coming after me can then make uh, a note of the same and just confirm that the same has been done. Because, you know, at the end of the day, everyone has a standard safety book that they follow, so if you're going to make any changes or if you see anything wrong, then it's up to you to uh, inform Rally HQ uh, of the same. So that's basically what I do um, an hour before, and I basically uh, open up the stage for the rest of the team. Yes, and also uh, <coughs> we'll be joined shortly by Norris Ongalo. He is the Chief Safety Officer um, with the WRC Safari Rally. He's going to be joining us on Zoom in a short while. And Abbas, there is one of the challenges because as you have to work with the sec uh, security teams. And this is access to spectator stages. Mm -hmm. What are the regular, for example, uh, so I, let me think of Soy Sam, for example, mm -hmm. because that's one of them. How do you then make sure that people adhere to the set timelines. Okay. What you say, well, some of the challenges that we have and we have to work with security is one is accessing to the stages. Most of the time they're driving, everyone is high, they want to see the rallies and they come late. By the time they're coming, the rally has already started. We have this rally route and the transport section. The transport section is equally important for us because mm. one, it enables the rally car to move from one stage to another. Yeah. And they are given time. Everything mm. in Rally is timing. Mm. And like I can tell you, today, Sunday, the Rally is going to start at this time. We are not going to change it. He has to work backward with that. Mm. We have to work backward with that. In preparedness, in setting up the stages. Now, when uh, fans come in, eh, they don't understand that. Because mm. once the Rally starts, <coughs> we are all focused on the Rally. You see? And now the security team now comes in to control the fl traffic flow. We have had issues whereby we, some spectators have tried to go into the Larani route. And you can imagine we are having the P1 cars, eh? mm -hmm. every three minutes a car goes in. Seat. Three cars driving at 160. How many minutes do you think they take a, a 30 kilometer stretch? 30 kilometer stretch, they take about what? 20, 22 minutes. That, that's about what they take. Yes. Mm -hmm. 22 minutes. Now take times nine cars. Mm -hmm. Actually, there were 12 this year, I think. <coughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. Now 12. Finish. Once it's finished, it goes to the next stage. Safety now has to wait until all those cars are out. That's when you can breathe. Mm -hmm. Then a spectator tries to come in because he thinks he's a rally driver. Mm -hmm. Those are the challenges that we face. Yeah. We always tell the people, please stay 70 meters away from the rally route. Because we know the dangers. Yes. Yes. All right. Okay, so we are with Abbas Murbe, who is a safety officer with the WRC Safari Rally, and we have got Karim Amoko. He is the chief marshal of the WRC Safari Rally. And now, let's move over to Norris Ongatlo, who is the chief safety officer. And, Norris, let's... Uh, it's a pleasure to speak to you, Norris. And just some two things that I uh, would like you to mention so that, uh, you know, we can get clarity on this, especially one, transport and uh, the roadblock behavior that Kenyans have times exhibited, uh, uh, so that we can know about that, and also more South Lake Road. So, Norris, good morning. You could tell us about, you know, the main traffic plan that is being set up so that Kenyans can adhere to it over Easter weekend. No, I do. Yes. Good morning. Yes, that is Norris Ngalo, the Chief Safety Officer and of the WRC Safari Rally. So, Norris, let's basically talk about the transport plan and actually the arrangements to ensure that traffic is well managed this time around because I think it's been acknowledged even at one of the highest offices that it's been a challenge. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, number one, uh, traffic is a 100% uh, uh, responsibility of the security team um, and the safety team. However, I am privy to the plans, and the, 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 there will be, there'll be um, 
a, a press conference um, pr just just close to the event to start, uh, you know, to putting together the plans uh, to the public. But again, also um, we this time round are planning to use um, civilian traffic marshals to complement the police traffic because we know very well that um, the number of uh, traffic policemen may not necessarily be enough to take care of the challenges we have. And we cannot take everybody from the country to bring them to Naivasha because uh, the rest of the country needs to be running. So to complement that, we will put in uh, uh, civilian traffic marshals and we have already spotted out the areas that uh, have been problematic and we will make sure that those places we have enough marshals that will ensure that um, traffic just keeps flowing. The most important thing is just to get the, the traffic flowing, nothing else. Now, the other one is also, you know, um, making sure that um, access is given to only those who are there. We know there are Kenyans who, to use the local language, who pull rank and say, Nimini Fulani, I am so and so. And so rather than use a spectator access gate, they want to use a competitor's access gate. What's the plan to make sure that this is adhered to? Uh, it, it, it has always been adhered to, let me put it that very clearly. The routes um, are well mapped out. The roads for, for, for rally car only are clearly mapped out. And nobody, as I say, nobody would be allowed in, probably only officials, be allowed in using the rally route, rally, rally gates. Everybody else will use the public gates, and within the public gates would, uh, for example, a place like uh, Hell's Gate, will uh, demarcate um, and have the general public go on one side and the VIPs go a different direction, but all using the same gate. We will have very clear markings, we will have very clear instructions with, um, from, from, from the marshals uh, on where to go. And this is all driven by the type of, um, you know, car sticker you have, the, the type of card you have, uh, pass rather. And over the years uh, that we've had the WRC Safari Rally, this is um, the fourth installment since we got back. What have been the learning lessons for the, safe, uh, for the safety team in terms of event preparedness and execution? Uh, I, I'm very glad and I'm very proud of my team, uh, for my team, uh, of my team rather. They, um, we have never had any safety challenges. I think except for last year where we had um, spectators um, um, uh, in, uh, in Sleeping Warrior uh, that were very close to the road that we had to cancel the stage, we've never had any incident. Um, and, and, and the learning of, of that particular incident is um, that um, we need to probably um, anticipate more, work closely with, this, with the farms to understand where they, they will be moving to and where they will be interested in. Uh, then we prepare for them. We are ready for them. Ours is not, not, not to hinder uh, funds from you know, viewing and, and having their best, uh, best uh, viewing points, but it's for us to make sure that the places they want to be, they are safe. Now, the other uh, thing is, how then, you know, are we working towards ensuring that some of this knowledge goes downstream? Because about here indicated that every marshal, who's, somebody works as a marshal or a safety officer, then gets affiliated to a club, such that this information goes down to those who are running the local circuit or even other events, say, for example, like the Valley Cross and Lotto Cross. You know, ideally... Um WRC Safari is supposed to be at the apex of the pyramid. Therefore, at the bottom of the pyramid is where we have the club events and the, and, 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 and the, the national events and the club events. And essentially then, we should be seeing that the quality that we have in the WRC events trickles down to the bottom of the pyramid. So as safety, we ask ourselves, how can we do this without necessarily pushing the budgets of training um, uh, the club members mm -hmm. to the clubs. So the easier one was for us to ensure that the clubs are the ones to give us the members who will be co-opted into this, the WRC Soccer Rally, and we train them. So the, 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 the requirement of um, club membership was for us to get people from clubs and not anybody else. So the people we train then go back to their clubs and now instill the same standards to the clubs in their club events and international events. Well, finally, the word to the members of the public, Norris, because I know you've got to go back to your HOD's meeting. 
All right. Uh, for me, two things, um, and I'm speaking this on behalf of the security team, that um, there are no roads that are good enough to take care of bad behavior. <laughs> so we can try as much as possible, even uh, have about 10, meters, 10, 10 kilometers wide road, but we still have people behaving badly. So we can't have good roads enough for bad behavior. So we must behave well. We must be courtesy. We must follow the rules and the rules and regulations of the road. There will be a lot of um, help on the road in terms of traffic marshalling and traffic management. Kindly plan your journey early. Uh, use alternative roads where possible. But we should not be seeing people overlapping. Well, the person overlapping is essentially saying he's more important than those who are patient on the road. So, uh, and, and the police will be very, very strict on this. There will be a lot of crackdown a couple of days prior to the event. So we don't want to, uh, you know, mess your Easter. So the best thing is just abide to the rules and the regulations of the road. Number two, for city uh, uh, matters, um, please, we have trained marshals. And these trained marshals are there to make your life easy. They're not to, there to hinder your, your, your spectating um, uh, uh, experience, but they are there to make sure that you spectate in a, a safe environment. Kindly adhere to them. Uh, we, we have a lot, lot of uh, spectating points, and, and, and by so doing, we have enough resources to make sure that those who go to those points will be, will, will, will be in safe points, it will, will be in safe um, hands. So kindly just adhere to the, you know, um, to the marshals that have been deployed to those points. Right. Thank you very much, Norris Ongalo. He is the chief safety officer and is well represented here by Abbas Murbe in studio. And because they've taken us through with lots of practical things, um, the safety instructions that we've got, there is the spectator guide and also the tablets that they do use. Thank you very much, Norris, for your time. We'll be taking a short break and we can wind up this conversation with Abbas Murbe and Kariba Moko who are working with the WRC Safari Rally Secretary to ensure that you're safe during the event. Ata msubiri mungu kama sikiza chuni yako, bonyeza star 812 star 501 hash. Kijana kanipigia simu wa meja wana huzuni, amifada ikayu ohi, ika muuliza kunani. Yapu nimechia jeti hada kuza mtu wa kujenga nyumba kwa mati, ika ungeza kumcha mungu, sifale kiwi, naishi kama lofa mlala hoi. Kupata msubili mungu kama skiza chun, bonyeza star 812 star 501 hash. Star 812 star 501 hash. Prienda, then your IQ is not functioning. Sitagi china, na sitagi. Open your eyes. Bunchu bunchu. Kizungu yake ni ya kuongea kwa mtumu. Hana ayifiki kwa mtumu yake. Nasuru lusikia wangi kwa wapia hapa kupeleka mtumu vayi. Tapia ni peleke hapa isili. You look very smart. Abana hii ime ime konewa hapo katonzoe ni hapo tuso wakone. Hii ni hako. Umenipati ya tu. Hiyo vanya na hile kitu wena taka. Itata ramba ringi yu. My name is Lisa Christofferson. I am the founder of Kenya's first all only women's safari rally, the Lionesses. In 2022, we founded this rally at Kasarani, eight women drivers, eight women navigators, 
something that has never been done in Kenya nor on the continent. So I'm here today driving in the Talenta Hela ladies team as the driver. Very excited. I'm a cancer survivor. I was diagnosed with stage 4 cancer in 2006, but here I am today fitter and stronger. And I don't know if you've heard the song, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. That's me. So today my motto is, guys, driving for change. So I'm going to be supporting children with cancer, Kenyatta Hospital, or any other hospitals around the country with uh, medication. We're going to raise money. So WRC, for those who don't know, is 1,200 kilometers. So for every kilometer, I have put a value of 1,000 shillings. That means I have to raise minimum 1.2 million Kenya shillings, okay? So also just going to talk to the kids, empowering them, and also encouraging them with that attitude. And it's that same attitude that you as a woman in today's male-dominant sport, such as rallying, you have to enter the sport with a bit of attitude. Otherwise, you're not going to survive. And it's not just female drivers. We need female navigators. We need female mechanics. We need female engineers. Do you know women bring a lot of energy to the table? And for me, it's just so fantastic because all of the ladies who are competing in this year's Talento Hela ladies team were all part of the Lioness Rally. So at least we've seen the growth from there to where it is today. And we're encouraging many, many more young women as well to take up the sport. There's going to be a rally school soon, announcing announcement was going to happen. So sign up if you're 18 years of age and you have a valid driving license. Why don't you come and join us? It's a fantastic sport and it's a lot of fun too. My name is Lisa and if you don't know what that stands for, it stands for Life is So Amazing. Yeah? So also remember the song, What Doesn't Kill You Makes You Stronger. Everything you do in life should make you stronger. Gain that experience that takes you to another level. I always believe life is like a book that has many chapters. And this is one of the chapters that we are experiencing. So follow me on my Instagram, Lisa underscore Christopherson, and you can be part of my journey. Sports Check on this Monday morning, the 18th day of March 2023, and we're having a conversation about the World Rally Championship, and this is mainly about the safety part of it and also medical interventions. We've had from Professor Raj Jekli, who is the Chief Medical Officer. We also have had from Loris Ongalo, who is the Chief Safety Officer, and in the studio with me, we've got Abbas Murbe, who is on my far left. He is a Safety Officer with the WRC Safari Rally and the Chief Marshal. And Kariba Moko ends. Let's come and build up on this uh, from what Norris has said, especially adhering to the regulations that you have. Mm -hmm. And but you know, we like to say that there are those people who will come in with very big cars, but they want to cut the queue mm -hmm. or you try getting through this. How do you manage that? It's a big challenge for us, and we have had those issues, eh? Because everybody with a big car is a VIP. And that's the time when you uh, need to get one too. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the time when you actually involve the security. Mm -hmm. I can tell you the safety and security work hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Because when the rally starts, our main focus is on the rally. So if there are any issues, for example, like a typical stage, when, how it is run, eh, there's a stage commander mm -hmm. who stays at the start of the stage, assistant who assists him, there's a safety officer, starts, and then assistant safety officer at the end, they don't move. Now if anything happens with him, they are what you call post chiefs. Now they cannot leave the position because the moment they leave the position, they have abandoned their garment. Mm -hmm. Now what happens is like Kariba once he finishes the rotate rotation, he is able to go see where the chokes are. That's when you're involved for security. The moment you see somebody, we don't even wait. You come out with a VVIP, you're on the rally route. We're not gonna talk. Because that pass does not allow you to go on the rally route. Mm -hmm. You can go to the VIP tent. Park, 
70 meters away from the rally route, we have no problem. But coming on the rally route is, is a no-go zone. Now, safety ranking, um, rating, especially because now you've got to work for this. Yeah. Where are we as a rally? No, so we, we actually rank quite highly. Um, I think one of the two positives about the Safari Rally in Kenya is it's one of the most watched rally circuits uh, globally. Uh, and one of the good things I think is that we've not had severe cases of, of um, public access to rally stages leading to a red flag or a closure of a stage, um, as you've seen in other countries. But I think we must, uh, the, run, the, ru the running call for the safety team uh, is to Fike Salama. And this is a conversation that we're having with the public saying, look, you've got to help us. Uh, we, we, we will do all we can to prepare for a safe event. But listen to the marshals, work with the marshals. We're here for you and we'll, uh, we'll keep s saying that. Uh, if a marshal directs you to a place, it may not make sense, but there's, a, there's a rules and procedure that he's following. So that's something that we urge the public. I mean, I mean the, the worst thing we would hate for us is to have uh, rally stages cancelled because of um, you know, the, it bad just being bad manners, bad. <laughs> uh, to put it lightly. But yeah, yeah it, it's really important for us that uh, we encourage the public to come for rally, but follow the rules when they come for rally that we've set uh, the procedures. And, you know, we've seen Kenyans wake up and need to go vote. We would also ask them to do the same thing. Wake up early to come watch rally. Don't, don't wake up at 8 and then come and make it an emergency for us. Please be there at 3 a.m. Uh, sunrise, uh, sunrises are pretty uh, magical. So for Brian and Kevin, if you want to come and uh, make romantic uh, gestures there, uh, <laughs> we welcome you to, to, to come. Uh, bring your girls in early. Uh, please, uh, please be there early. 4 a.m. Being a, being a good time. Uh -huh. Something that I want to mention, I would like you to, you know, direct as one. Mm -hmm. People go have picnics, mm -hmm. doing their own, they do their own mm -hmm. cooking, oh, my choma and all that. Yeah. What are the safety regulations so that you don't have a bushfire? No, no, no. We always tell them. In fact, we have dedicated areas where, especially most of our spectator area, we allow parking. I mean, uh, picnics. picnics. Because what we do, we take precautions. Remember, our team does risk assessment. For us to adjudicate a place for spectators, we look at all the risks. Mm. We'll have a fire engine, mm. extinguishers, medical. Raj has gives us an ambulance which stays there until after the spectators leave. Mm. We have security team moving mm. around to control. So we encourage, in fact, we have had people, and you'll be surprised, eh? Those who come for picnic early, early but we call them early but, eh? We haven't had any problems with them. Mm. Mm. It is just what Karibo is saying. The ones who want to oversleep, nine o'clock, they want to force themselves inside. Mm -hmm. Once the rally starts, that's it. That's, that's it. it. Okay. And, but, no. and the most important thing, uh, what I want is, is to tell the public is that let us respect the marshals. The marshals are our ambassadors. I could be roaming. They are the, our eyes for the WRC. They are the people who actually maintain the rally the way it's supposed to be as the perspective cool. Okay. Thank you very much. Abbas Bupe, he's a safety officer with the WRC Safari Rally. And maybe you could just hold up some of the beads so that they know who to talk to uh, whenever you're there. That's the safety marshal, and uh, the chief marshal has got that. And if you see Takamoto Katsuta's car is, is packed somewhere on the stage, then the purple one. That is the hybrid electric vehicle. Yes. Quarantine marshal. So if you see one around there, you can go just stand away from him and watch everything there. Thank you very much, gentlemen. See you down in Naivasha. We're saying Eastern Rally and Tufike Salama. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We'll be playing you back some clips from this safari from last year. And next, let's talk about another event that is happening over Easter. We're talking about the Kenya Beach Games. We had them last year. One year later, they're going to be back in Malindi. That's after this short break. Drama on the final day for rally leader Seb Oshie. It's the tailgate missing. The tailgate's missing on this car. Oshie's been off. He's lost the back of the car. Let's have a look what happened here. Yeah, we've just clipped something. Very slow speed, but it's enough. 8.6 seconds quicker than anyone else through there, though, despite losing the spoiler and the rear tailgate. What happened? Uh, just went like in a fish fish. Can you believe it?
the tree and I'm very surprised, to be honest. You didn't expect that. Despite the dust now swirling around inside the Yaris, he and Vincent Landé were 8.1 seconds quicker than Calderon and Pera on stage 15. With a makeshift fix, a bin liner and balaclavas getting them through the morning loop with their lead still intact. Roddenberry hadn't given up hope of winning, but was struggling with understeer. Calais, oh, oh. We had a big slide, and then it, 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 it basically it came back. It was quite <laughs> to be, be driving on it. It, it doesn't work out. I'm understeering a lot, and then uh, moments like this happen. I need to put to the rest of the Hyundai were battling mechanical issues again. Thierry Noble's brake cooling duct was hanging loose, while Esapeka Lappi was limping along with only front-wheel drive after damaging a third prop shaft of the week. Danny Sordo was hanging on to fifth place, but battling a lack of power steering on some of the most brutal stages of the season, which left him exhausted. The penultimate stage is Osseria, meaning peaceful in Nassau. But for the Toyota drivers, it was anything but. Set for an historic repeat of their 1, 2, 3, 4 finish in 2022, all suffered as the Yaris's scooped up the fresh fed, causing water and oil temperatures to rise and the crews to be covered in dirt. Proper so far in the, in the deep sand, really, really deep outside, just trying to go through, we are fully in the cover in the car. Let's see what we can do about it. The mud beard suits you. Looking good, mate. Thank you. They all survived, just, but it was a stressful warm-up for the Wolf Power stage, which would begin with Seb Ogier leading by 9.2 seconds. A return to the fearsome Hell's Gate did not daunt Thierry Neuville, recovering maximum points from the Wolf Power stage to minimise the damage done in his championship challenge this weekend, with Oitanek following suit in second place. But all eyes were on the fight for victory. Ogier surviving a smashed windscreen to survive by 6.7 seconds in the closest ever finish to the Safari Rally Kenyan. Unbelievable. Look at that. Even on the power stage, I got a stone on the wind tree. I think uh, I had a lot of issues to face this weekend, but uh, it could have been a much more comfortable race for us in terms of pace. We had a really good pace, but a lot of misfortune, but I'm happy that we bring it home. Ralph and Perry gave it everything but remaining philosophical about his season. A bit disappointing, and it ends to the vegan. Um, you always want to fight for the win, but uh, good point for the, for the season. Anyway. So Ogier leads an incredible top four finish for Toyota, with Sordo fifth ahead of Tank, Lube and Nerville. Rob and Perra now leading the championship by 37 points over Nerville, heading into the next event on the gravel of Estonia. Sports check on this Monday morning. A good morning to you. My name is Daniel Wahome, and it's all conversation around sports and also keeping up with what's happening in the news as the Health Cabinet Secretary, Honorable Susan Akumicha, meets with doctors' unions, you know, to bring an end to the ompas between the union and the government. The Judicial Service Commission is doing interviews for the Chief Registrar of the Judiciary and also, we've got the launch of the strategic plan around lands that is also happening today. So that's just part of our news cycle. And also, news that has come in. This is to do with rallying. One Japanese rallying legend, Kenji Roshi Mizuka, has passed on. And it's somebody everyone would have loved to see in the safari. Competed in the old safari and also raid rallies. So, and yeah, made some of the cars, I think the Mitsubishi brand, quite popular within the country. So right now, let's move on to our second conversation, and this is the beach games that will be taking place in Malindi. And this is over the Easter weekend on the 29th, 30th, and 31st. Same weekend as the rally, just at the uh, place where Vasco da Gama said that he had discovered uh, new lands, but that is a whole different story. In studio with me, two ladies. On my immediate left, I've got Susan Diambo, who is the development lead at the National Olympics Committee of Kenya. Welcome. Thank you. And we've got Steffi Wairimo, who is the head of communications at NOC. Welcome. Thank you. 
Yeah. Yes. And as we continue with this interview, our sign language interpreter, these are, is Anongeshi. So, Steph, let me start with you. Last year, the Kenya Beach Games did take place. We know different sporting disciplines always have their own beach events. There is beach soccer, there is beach volleyball we know about. But what was the experience last year with 700 athletes all gathered in one town? Uh, last year we had the first edition of the Kenya Beach Games. We had close to 10 sports participate and it was quite overwhelming even for the town, uh, contributed to the economic growth and we are looking forward to this year because we have more sports. Uh, we are thinking of introducing even team sports. Uh, so it's going to be exciting and that's why we put it over Easter when everybody is going to be home, uh, families, uh, children love close school. So Malinde will come alive during Easter and we can't wait to have all our sports uh, there during the Easter holiday to celebrate sports. It's also just something exciting to bring us all together. You know, sports is, uh, is one of the ways that we can bring Kenyans and rally all of us to come and celebrate the Easter holidays together. And let, let me stick, uh, talk about this. It's that there was a build-up to the African Beach Games. And what was the reaction of the different federations that are involved, that were involved in the Beach Games last year? Uh, yeah, so the Kenya Beach Games last year was, um, we were trying to also see how ready we are before we go to Tunisia for the Africa Beach Games. And uh, most federations were excited. Some of them, it was the first time they're having the Beach Games there. Um, some have been able to go even up to the Olympics, like the Beach Volleyball, so it was not a new experience for them. Wrestling was among the... People really enjoyed watching beach wrestling. Uh, this time we're going to have now judo. So last year it was exciting even for the crowd. We were even able to put a boxing ring in the middle of the, of the beach. So it was quite exciting. Well, let me come to you, Susan. And, um, you know, when you see some of these sports and how athletes you know, adapt to beach versions of it, what is it that you saw last year at uh, Buntuani? Um, so we, we actually... First of all, Kenya, we have uh, talent, um, so the idea is to create um, a different offering of sports uh, because we have talented people, uh, so probably they have tried the other versions, the, the usual versions of the sports, um, but we are giving them an opportunity now to develop in a new sport. And what we've seen probably is uh, some top athletes um, who are probably in like in tennis, in volleyball, um, in wrestling, um, who uh, did well or did not do too well in that sport, and they go to the to the beach version and they do very well. Um, so uh, we have seen talent growth, and we have actually seen some people now take up the beach version of the sport to be like their main sport. Uh, so um, it's also a development of talent and we believe that Kenyans can do very well um, in, beach, in beach sports. Uh, it's a new sports offering, um, it's uh, just gaining traction in the world. Uh, now there are very many sports that are creating the, 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 the beach versions. Uh, the, the idea is to make it, um, to make short versions of the sports uh, more exciting because now uh, with everything that's happening around the world, there are too many competing um, distractions um, or something like that. Uh, so the idea is to create an uh, event that is going to be very interesting for youth. Um, it's fast, it's short, it's uh, fun. Um, so uh, we feel that we really have an opportunity to develop a very uh, nice uh, product, a uh, new sports product for Kenya and for the world. And if we continue in this way, we feel that Kenya is going to be one of the countries that Africa and the world are going to be looking at in terms of the development of the sport. Well, the word you are looking for is attention span. <laughs> <laughs> because we know, I know I can watch a cricket game mm. all day, but everyone well wants to watch the T20 version. Now, just give us a whole idea about the Boom 20 waterfront and how you manage this for the, I think, 11, 12 disciplines, about the 12 disciplines that you'll be having this year. How do you manage that real estate? Okay, so uh, first of all, this year we have 15, so we have expanded the spots. Um, 
the sports offering. Uh, so maybe just allow me to take the opportunity to take us through what we what we have, and I hope I can remember um, all of them, if not most of them. Okay, Yeah. Aquathlon. Now you'll explain that the, in, in simple English is beach handball, beach tennis, beach soccer, beach volleyball, beach wrestling. There is sprint rowing, open water swimming, surfing, down racing, and baseball five. Okay, <laughs> so I think you're missing um, you're missing judo. Judo. Um, so there's judo, there's taekwondo um, added on the program. Uh, when we sent out the um, the publicity, uh, we had uh, hockey, for instance, come and tell us like, why are we out of this? Uh, so there's actually a hockey version of the beach game. So we are going to include hockey into the into the into the games, and that's what has been happening. So. We develop it to send the publicity, then someone comes and says baseball was just recently added, it was not in the initial program. Uh, but we met baseball and they said, hey, but baseball, we just need a small space, um, probably equal to a basketball court or less, and we, we are able to play. So uh, we need to be included in the beach game. So as you can see, uh, more sports, um, uh, if, if hockey has a beach version of the sport, then um, it means that it has it has uh, it has it has really it has really developed. Uh, so that's 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 the idea that uh, we 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 make it very very inclusive. So like aquathlon is um, is a swim and run. It's a shorter version of triathlon. So now there is no biking. Uh, so um, as you can see, that 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 is that is the trend. Um, yeah, so that, that is really the idea. Steve, let me come to sports where there is actually, where the water is involved. It's open swimming, um, you see surfing, and uh, I think down racing. How have you seen the locals react to that? Because they say the beach is, they've been there every day, but how do they react to seeing somebody come do something different? So actually how we've uh, distributed the sports, they are competitive sports and demonstration sports. Because once we went to Malindi last year, we found out that the locals are really interested in their traditional sports. So though racing is actually for the traditional, um, it's actually for the Malindi residents. It's so, a demonstration sport. Yeah, it's a demonstration sport. Um, there was also suggestion on fishing. So they are quite exciting uh, demonstration. And You're talking about sport fishing? Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, the locals really love it, and for them it's something that they've grown up doing it. So they are looking forward for this time, to, this time round, to be able to compete even with Kuala, Mombasa. So everybody wants to come and show how good they are, because for them that's what they've known all their lives. Open water swimming for them? Um, so open water swimming, they can go to the deep end, and they are really excited to see how far... Um, we've grown this year because, as Susan has said, it's talent scouting also. And, you know, those, if you can swim that long, you can only imagine how they can do even in the swimming pool. So we are looking forward to tapping talent even for the youth because it's not only for the senior uh, athletes, it's also for the junior athletes. Um, you know, for the changes that come with sports, and let me see, um, I know I will come to you because just because of a bias that you've had before coming from the tennis world. How, for example, does is beach tennis different from or everyday lawn tennis? Uh, first of all, it's the, as, as you, were, you were saying before, it's the attention small, it's short. Uh, of course, it's a shorter court mm -hmm. compared to the, to the normal tennis. Um, it's a lighter ball, it's fast. Um, it's it's more of uh, our partners, uh, so it's 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 just it's more exciting. Uh, so the, those are the difference. Of course, the court is the, the racket is, is is shorter, it's lighter than the normal one. Um, it's played over a net rather than um, on the, a net that's on the ground. Uh, so the variations there there are small variations, but, but, but they are. There is, but yes, a okay, yes, it? yes. There is also air badminton. Um, it was not in the program. I've, I've not had the pleasure of seeing it being played. But there is also air badminton. Um, so it's also so the idea is just shorter versions of the sport. 
And then uh, the other big thing about beat sports is sustainability. You know, the sports world is really struggling with the issue of sustainability. You need a big stadium to host a football tournament. You need a big stadium for a hockey tournament. Um, you need a very elaborate um, uh, surface for, for say, uh, handball or, or tennis or hockey. So beach uh, sports, the aspect of sustainability comes through because you really just need the beach, uh, the sand, uh, create a court, and the court can be created ev anywhere with, um, with equipment that is movable. Um, so then they are smaller. Mm -hmm. uh, so that aspect of sustainability is also very big. Uh, you'll notice in most uh, beach uh, events, even the spectator stands are uh, temporary. Yes. So there's a lot of sustainability um, options to eat, and that's why it's easier for 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 uh, so for like knock to host it. Um, it's easier even for the other world of sports to host these events, and that's why they are really promoting it because it speaks to what the sports world is trying to do to promote sustainability in sports. Um, and like for us, I mean, uh, we, you've seen how we successfully hosted the last event. Um, we believe that this one is going to be even better. And this is just a strategic direction by the executive committee uh, to be able to host a world event. So why not host a world event? We have the facility, we really just need the beach and the goodwill of the people and we can host the world events. So, well, we'll be talking about that and, you know, uh, you know how well you know, Kenya would prepare for this uh, event. And at the end of, everyone talks about uh, making sure that you leave a place better than you found it. How do you ensure that Buntuani, at the end of three days of a lot of sporting action, the only thing that would naturally be that should naturally occur there is seaweed. Plastic bottles out. All the trash out. How do you manage this? Um, one of the key factors, and we want to thank our sponsors uh, who are coming on board, is ensuring that they are partnering with us in terms of sustainability. Uh, as Susan has said, on top of the air control measures that we are going to do, we've ensured that the Buntuani waterfront is surrounded by beams. So even the water, because you're going to be drinking a lot of water, mm -hmm. uh, we are advising athletes to carry their own water bottles. But on top of that, any plastic bottle is put inside um, bins that are all over the park. So we ensure that there is no littering. We ensure that uh, it's going to be safe even for the kids because there's a kids area, there's a family area in the park. So we want to ensure that the area remains as clean as possible. And we just want to continue promoting sports because in sports we want to keep on drinking water and staying fit. Mm -hmm. So we are going to make sure that there are beans all over the place. The other one that, uh, that everyone, you know, that at times forgets is in, um, the making the most of this blue economy. What were the main gains for you last year? Um, I think for us we were able to see first of all that we can be able to host even a bigger crowd and that's why we are hoping that we can bid even for African entry Games in the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the entry is free uh, thanks mm -hmm. to the county government uh, and it's Easter holiday so everybody will be coming to the to the park that, that uh, weekend. So for us we are also partnering with the Blue Economy and the communities around the coastal area so that we can be able to ensure that we are the series that you've talked about, mm -hmm. we are going to clear them and we've also partnered with almost a hundred volunteers that are going to help us just clear the beach days before the event and even afterwards. So for us, we've been able to find partners that are coming together and they are pushing towards the same agenda. Susan, um, let me talk about actually you know, engaging these people and transferring some of this knowledge about if, uh, you know, little event management because they say you can, for example, if I leave in a forest for a long time. At times I get too familiar with it, but I don't realize there is more I could do if somebody else came in. How do you leave them with that knowledge such that they can keep doing it every I mean even not wait for the other next year match? Mm -hmm. So uh, for us, uh, the first thing is, of course, when you are scouting for, when you had the idea that you want to host beach games, the first thing was to scout for, um, for venues. 
so we scouted at the, the entire coastal area and we found uh, Buntwani. Uh, it's actually a park. Uh, they had some of the uh, facilities already set. And then we showed them what more they can do with the space because it's a really amazing space, expansive uh, beach, beach uh, space. Um, so for us, we found it was perfect for our use because, of course, of the multiple spots that we were hosting. And uh, so what we did is we believe that we showed them the possibilities. Um, so if they were only doing um, handball, for instance, and football, so we shown them the possibility that it's possible to set up a basketball court and uh, do a beach basketball. We have set up a wrestling ring, we have set up a boxing ring, a judo ring. Uh, so we believe that uh, we have partnered with our national federations, of course. Um, so our national federations, some of them had already done some beach events. Uh, some of them had done some pilots, some of them had not done anything. But you see the capacity is now building in everyone. So from our national federations who had their um, experience, uh, from us who, has, who are showing them that, well, in the world, this event is a beach event, so can we make it possible? So we've, made, we've shown the federations also that it's possible we can have the event. Uh, to Buntuan itself, um, uh, with what they can do with the space, with what more they can do with the space, to the county and how much they can offer their, their, um, their county people with what they have. So as you can see, the capacity has been built uh, uh, for, for everyone at all levels. And when we go out of the technical bit, we go now to the, to the other events bit, from accommodation, from food, uh, hosting from infrastructure, what they have, what do they, they do not have. So we believe that this event is really bringing a lot uh, to the county and uh, we actually hope that we can do, do it more, do it in other counties, um, expand it to the lake region as well, uh, so that we can just show Kenyans uh, how, much, how much we have as a, as a country and how much we can do because there's, there's a lot more that we can do with what we have. But let me just ask, how, um, if you were to ask, but how far is, or how long, what's the size of that beach? And I'm considering um, tides, when you've got the high tide, because at times the waters now come all the way close. How long is it, maybe from the sea? Oh, that's a very okay, about how, question. Like, if you were to say, how close, okay, when you were there last year, mm -hmm. at times, how close did the water get to the playing areas? Um, I think they've done a good job in controlling that because um, we were able to play beach tennis, which was the closest to the, to the ocean. But I think it's almost, um, I'd say, a two-kilometer stretch. So wow. it's quite, yeah, it's quite long. And, and that's why even this time we are introducing the beach run. It's something interesting that we want to begin. Um, we've not seen it done in the country, but because of how long the beach is, we want to try and do the beach run. So I hope, I hope you can come over and try that beach run. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, be, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be pushing a Subaru somewhere. <laughs> and I definitely would like to see that, because mm. I think we previously had it at the African Games. Yeah. yeah. The, Beach half marathon. Yeah, mm -hmm. although it was on the on the road, so we actually want to do it at the beach. Yeah, yeah. That's the interesting bit that we'd like to <laughs> to include in in this event. One of the, one of the key partners you have is the Kilifi County Government. Just to talk about that relationship and the kind of support that they do give to NOC. Uh, so last year when we wrote to, our, to the coastal areas and we're looking for partners to come on board and do the Kenya Beach Games, Kilifi was one of the counties that came forth. And when we went and visited Buntuani, we saw that it fits what we want to do. So it already has the space, uh, sports already take place, takes place there. Mm -hmm. So we've been able to be partners and beyond even the beach games, now we are looking into capacity building. That's why we'll be having an administration course two days before the beach games. So on top of just 
uh, the beach games, we want to also ensure that their technical officers, the sports officers, they'll be able to learn on how to conduct sports in the region. So I think it's a partnership that is just going beyond the Kenya Beach Games, and it's something that we're looking forward to build, uh, and build a legacy since it's the first county that welcomed us. Uh, so it's a partnership that will continue growing even beyond sports. No. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Steffi Werimo, who's Head of Communications at the National Olympic Committee of Kenya. And also, Suzanne Adiambo, she is the development lead. Oh, yes, Suzanne Adiambo, she's a development lead at the National Olympic Committee of Kenya. It's the Kenya Beach Games. But now we take a little bit of diversion because this weekend, all across the country, secondary school someone games are getting to the regional level. So a lot of preparations being done and uh, the sports that have been played, basketball, five on five, handball, 15th rugby, hockey, swimming, athletics, and cross country. And let us talk to the man who was tasked with hosting the nation last year. He is the secretary of the Kenya Secondary School Sports Association Western Region, Mwalimu Quinto Omusugu. A very good morning to you, Mwalimu. Okay, um, looks like Quinto Omosugu is not ready. Remember, it is the Term 1 Secondary School Regional Finals that will be taking place from the 20th to the 23rd of March, and this is across the country. Basketball, 5 on 5. We've got handball, rugby, 15s, hockey, swimming, athletics, and cross country. The Secretary of the Western Region of the Kenya Secondary School Sports Association, Quinto Omosugu. Good morning to you. Let him just set up, uh, get his setup ready and see how this works. Um, back to Susan Adiambo and Steffi Wairimu from the National Olympic Committee of Kenya. Um, the other thing that you would like to see is um, the Kilifi government, they made that bid and they got it. What other interests have you seen, say, probably from even a wild one, um, Turkana County? I'll tell you a wild one. Mm -hmm. Kaku. Aha. <laughs> yes, that is in Turkana County. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. So there is, uh, I mean, uh, going back to what I was saying before, uh, beach games, um, we are just looking at, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a sustainable event. Mm -hmm. uh, you only need uh, sand, sand to create a a court, uh, whatever surface to play. Um, Kakuma has uh, has a river, dried up river. It has a sand, uh, a beach uh, with sand. Um, there is talent. There is sports being played. Mm -hmm. um, so, so why not? Okay. Uh, we have seen. Um, it was Mtitoande. Mtitoande. There is a beach, uh, so they they actually called us um, and showed us and it is said. The County. We have, uh, I, I believe it's mm -hmm. Makweni, and they are so why not? Mm -hmm. um, we have had interest from Homa Bay, from Gori. <laughs> uh, there is a beach. Uh, there are water spots that can be played. Um, there is uh, there is water. There is the beach. Uh, so why not? So what we are saying is uh, there's really no limit uh, for us um, and we welcome the counties um, and if they are watching, if they are listening, uh, to invite us to talk to us uh, so that we can figure out how can we do this together. Uh, we, we are open, we have the, the, the will, uh, so we just need support of the counties and uh, we are going to be seeing uh, talent being uh, showcased everywhere in this country uh, where, where, where it's possible. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Susan. Well, right now, let's get a conversation about the regional finals all happening around the country, 20th to the 23rd of
this month. Top one school games. So let's do a check on this and we start out west and we've got the secretary of the Kenya Secondary School Sports Association, uh, Western Region, Quinto Musugu. Good morning, Mwalimu. Mwalimu, sir. All right, thank you for joining us this morning. And um, first yes. of all, just give us a whole idea of how, you know, the Tam One games, we are talking about uh, basketball, five on five, handball, 15 rugby, hockey, um, swimming, athletics, and cross country have happened yes. in the western region counties. Yeah, this, these are KSS games. Hello. Yes, we can hear you continue, Molim. Yeah, we, we are uh, doing KSS games, and as you mentioned, we are organizing some one games starting uh, on the 20th, the 23rd, in the Riga County. Our main venue will be Nyangori High School. And the games, as mentioned, we have a basketball, 5-on-5, five five, handball, hockey, rugby, 15, athletics, and swimming. All right. Maybe you could just give us um, the real distrib uh, distribution of these sports and the participants and what to look out for from Western region. I will start by saying that uh, Western is very competitive. Every county has had its games. I think they ended uh, a week ago. And uh, Western will present very formidable teams uh, in basketball. Uh, remember last year, uh, girls, the channel. National champions who are bitter girls. And when you come to have more girls than single girls, they have been reigning champions for some time. When you come to hockey, um, single boys high school and the Chigoi girls uh, emerged the champions last year and at the national level, Musingu are the crowned the national champions. But the two teams proceeded to represent the country in the Fiesta games at the year Rwanda. Rugby 15. Have, historically, when you look at most of the from Western Europe, uh, recently you had Butler and Colonzo. These are teams from Western, and they have dominated that area a lot. In athletics, I'm sure we shall put up a speed 35 because Valley have always been challenging us it is the cost of the region I think it, but as Western also have a very good in that area. So overall speaking, uh, the preparations are underway and the starting of Wednesday at two PM we shall conduct our opening ceremony at the Yangori Boys High School and we shall have the first match of the fixture in basketball five on five, hitting the Terra Girls versus Tigoi. These are arc rivals for some time. Something that we did see last year from uh, Western Kenya was a very, very huge turnout in terms of spectators. Yes. What were the lessons yes, learned yes. and what are the plans to make sure that this is well controlled this year? Yeah, the, 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 people, of Western, uh, the people of Western love sports. I'm sure even in time one games they come in large numbers. So normally we have to prepare adequately, security-wise. We normally involve the national police. But also, maybe an advantage to the organizers, when we go to the Higa, the venues are a bit widespread. When you look at the distance from Chavakali, where we shall host rugby teams, to Tigoi, which is the far end towards uh, Kisumu and Yawori, where we shall have athletics, and in between here we have other venues, then we will find that we, we, we shall somehow manage to distribute the funds so that we don't have so many of them crowding in one place and pose a challenge. But otherwise, I think with the proper arrangements we put in place, I'm sure we shall be able to contain the large number of funds that will appear to support their teams. Just like last year in football, I think the whole nation witnessed 
how Kakamega within the stadium was still that, that the, the situation was under control because of proper arrangements. Okay. Now, the other one that we'd like to talk about is in Kenya, everyone talks about the integrity of sports. What's the work that you've made sure that these secondary school games uh, have got some uh, real high level of integrity? Yeah, we will have isolated cases of cheating in the past. And uh, as I'm speaking now, efforts are being made by cases so that we, we go digital. We are going to, to keep uh, necessary information concerning our leads in a database. And because of that, I'm sure technology is going to help us have the cheating. And that is one measure we're taking place to make sure that our games uh, maintain the status and the integrity required. Uh, so that we only have the students who are uh, eligible to be ready, taking on to the fields. We do not want mercenaries and the people penetrating our games, yet they do not deserve to play in our championships. So one of the measures we are taking is going digital, and I'm sure probably by the time we get to Machakos for the one national games, we shall have the database of all our athletes in, in an app so that it is possible to fight that uh, challenge. Otherwise, uh, we, we hope that uh, we shall give everybody fair and equal chance so that at the end of the championship, it is the best athlete, it is the best team, it is the best coach and the best team that wins our games, probably in the and the center of the leader. Finally, we are getting to a point of transition in our education system and in about a, a couple of in just a year and over one year to come, our next two years, yes. Um, yes. we shall be having what is known as senior secondary school. What's the transition plan yes. um, in place? Because you're going to have students who make, ha who will be, I mean, secondary school will be a totally different thing. Yeah, um, I start by saying these are the means of education activities, and as I'm speaking to you now, there are our efforts to modify these games. But going by what the current curriculum is and maybe what is in the offing because of the CBC, we still shall have KSSS uh, being uh, undertaken by the senior school. And right now, as we're speaking this year, I think this is the pioneer year for JSS uh, activities. There, there is a directorate also in charge. So we shall continue to have KSSS and we shall also continue to have JSS. And as I'm speaking even to you right now, we also have a primary activities going on. So, uh, so I think the three categories shall continue to operate in the from the community to education to run, modify and look at the structure of these games so that we have a common plan going forward. All right, thank you very much, Quinto Omosugu, for being uh, with us this morning and we want to see some formidable teams coming in from the Western Region Secondary School Games Tam 1 Finals and all the best and since you'll, you'll be closer uh, this time round, see you in Machakos once the Nationals are on. Yes. Thank you for joining us. Thank you again. Yes, you'll be in Machakos. Yes. So remember that the national games will take place in Machakos. They're going to be organized by the Eastern Region. Last year, um, we saw a whole game changer in terms of youth sports in the country. So we now get back to our conversation, and this is about the Kenya Beach Games. And on my immediate left, I've got Susan Adiamba, who's the development lead at the National Olympic Committee of Kenya, and Steffi Irimo, who's head of communications. And Steffi, for those athletes, let me who were at the beach games last year and went to compete um, in the African beach games. There was a close turnaround sign, so uh, they, uh, every athlete says they want to be active at that. What were the stories they were given and the opportunities that come with them? Um, I think one of our biggest stories is the 3x3 three three basketball because the ladies team has gone ahead and um, is now in the Olympic qualification pathway. They will be going to Japan to try and qualify for Paris 2024. So during, we would never have known their capabilities, uh, how big they can go, had they not come to Malindi and then we've gone to Tunisia. They won, now they are the African champions. 
And so they'll be going to Japan and trying to go to Paris, making history as the first time Kenya will participate maybe in the Olympics. So I think that's one of the biggest stories. Um, beach soccer, handball was also in Tunisia. They were the silver medalists. So some very nice stories came out from the Kenya Beach Games. And we're excited for this time round. Just give me a, nice, a picture of you know what beach basketball would look like because I'm <laughs> trying to imagine a ball a sand, sand basically. Uh, I think six. the audience can see it from the screen. It mm -hmm. took us almost half a day to put out that um, surface, which uh, comes from FIBA uh, three by three. It has to be certified, so it took us almost half a day to just put out that surface uh, there in Buntuani, and we still have to put it out this time. It's the same one that will be used in Tunisia, so it's certified across all competitions. So it is not exactly played at the <laughs> beach sand, but it is played by the beach. Yeah. Right on the beach. <laughs> um, Tunisia, uh, and the build-up that you know, you'd like to see for the African beach games, uh, we don't mind them coming to Kenya next year. Mm. <laughs> 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 Uh, so what we are doing now is really we are building up. We are building up our teams uh, to be uh, the best at the world stage. So we are not just looking at the African Games. We are looking at uh, the World Beach Games. Uh, so we are helping our national federations to uh, create competitions, uh, to do talent identification, uh, to do um, an event uh, um, so that it can get more people playing the sport. Uh, so everything that we are doing is, is, is small actions towards that. Um, besides, of course, um, showing our capacity and building our capacity to host um, these uh, international events. Uh, so yeah, that is, that is really that is the future of, 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 of the beach games for us. I saw something, something. Yeah. Just tell us what you, what, because I know the people there would really like to do this. Uh, it's good you, you brought it up and um, I think this is an opportunity for me to, to make a call. Uh, we are looking for, um, for surfing, uh, for surfers. Uh, we really, there's no federation in Kenya. We, we don't know uh, where they are. Um, uh, so this is really, it's an open call. Uh, if you are a surfer, if you know a surfer, if you know where we can get surfers, because um, we, what we want to do is to expand our 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 sports. Um, we are looking at qualifying for Paralympic Games. Uh, we are still in um, the qualification period of the Paralympic Games. We are looking at LA 2028. Uh, surfing is in the Olympic program. Uh, so, um, are there surfers out there? Do you know one? Uh, we'd like to include them in the in the program, and we'd like to include them in our development program as we build toward the Olympics and the other games that are coming in the future. Well, I hope that message will go to somebody who's in struggle but be inventive. <laughs> they might come to you <laughs> in the afternoon. Um, you know, telling you yes. What did I tell him? Let's work together for this. But overall, um, making a call, uh, Steve, because this is it, um, you know, making a communication and also engaging the locals such that um, it's Easter, there are those who will, uh, there are those who will be there, you know, holidaying, others will be there by default, it's their place of work. How are you making sure that there's no, uh, how, do we get, how do we get the noise out? So um, besides media tours, we we'll also we're also partnering with the county. So we'll be doing road shows uh, throughout the county just to be able to rally people to come to the park. But it's also one of the biggest parks uh, down there. So most people go there. It's also Ramadan time, so most people just assemble there. There's just a huge mosque uh, right beside it. Uh, Malindi is also a very touristic town, and uh, we can't wait to see everybody go down there. So some uh, some will be coming up towards the rally. Some of us will be going down towards the beach. Yeah, so we'll be going there just to celebrate sports and talent. And we're just, every day we're just rallying people down at the coast to continue uh, rallying each other so that we can go and support our athletes and just having even like last time we had uh, Ferdinand Manyala there who was such a big I know everybody wanted a picture with him so you never know who we might bring down at the Kenya Beach Games this time round. How slow did you do the 2 km? <laughs> 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 so that you can get a picture with everyone. He did beach tennis. 
<laughs> yeah, he tried some beach tennis. Um, it's also an opportunity for, for everybody to try a new sport. Uh, so you never know who will bring down at the Kenya Beach Games this time round. Well, we are waiting for that surprise guest. We all know the impact that Ferdinand Omanyala may have. Um, which called over the last years, it's been known as the Ferdinand Omanyala effect on sports. Thank you very much, Stacey. Thank you very much, Susan. Thank you. For being with us. And we will be ready to enjoy the beach games and also enjoy the safari rally, all happening over Easter. Thank you for being with us over the past two hours on Sports Check this Monday morning. Moving on, we shall now have our Swahili News program, uh, Kurunzi Mashinani, and it's going to be followed by our interview program, Tamrinya. Your host is going to be Khalid Abdullahi. My name is Daniel Wahome. Our sign language interpreter has been Anwan Wangeshi. Have a good day. is on. Today, I want us to talk about our relationships and how we treat each other. If you're not in a relationship, still keep watching. There's something for you too. I'm Mike Lutti, your host for today. In the show, we find out what young people say about gender equality in relationships. In Liberia, we ask young 77 percenters how they approach relationships, classic or modern. Then we hear what our sex and relationship expert, Kaz, has to say. And in the DRC, we meet Rachel Molo, who has built up a cleaning empire. Do you remember that time in 2016 when former Nigerian president, Muhammad Buhari, said his wife belonged in the kitchen, his living room, and his other room, Despite significant progress towards gender equality in Africa, there's still much work to be done. For instance, a video of this man expressing his traditional views on women has garnered over 10 million views on our Instagram channel. Let's have a look. I stand against the issue of women having equal rights with men in the home. And women must be submissive. It never used to happen like that. The only reason why we have a feminist, we have a woman activist, it is because they have acquired education. So would you rather they just stayed at home, weren't educated? Like that's, that's the role of the woman. They have to be home. They have to take care of the house, the home, the, the house activities. That, that's, that's it. That's tradition. That's our culture. Why is that you adapt the other book culture okay so quick question i'm a woman here who's doing this job of asking questions and moderating i would say i'm independent does that bother you yeah oh okay he took part in the street debate we want to present to you this week edith kimani went to monrovia to investigate the role of women in relationships by speaking to this man and other librarians here it is And welcome back to the 77% Street Debate. This week, we are in Liberia's capital of Monrovia. Now, you might be familiar with the expression, strong African woman. In this country, they certainly are, having had a female president in Ellen Sirleaf Johnson. But this strength in women is sometimes discouraged when it comes to romantic relationships, particularly in the African context. And today we want to find out why. Who better to answer this question for me than some Liberians? And we're going to start with the couple... On the panel, we have a couple. They're so loved up. Austin and Chantal, thanks for joining us. So let's start with the basic question of your day-to-day. -day. When you wake up in the morning, give me a little clue about who does what in the morning. What's your morning routine like? Chantal, you're really smiling. Let me start with you. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, in the morning, I wake up around 5, five like 5.30, and get my kid ready for school while he's there getting ready for work. Okay, so would you say that your domestic responsibilities are sort of equally split between the two of you? Yeah, it is. 
Yeah. Basically, I'm able to wake up early morning and get hot water for the kids. I'm able to be bathing the little girl.